Translation, Krishna consciousness means constantly associating with the Supreme Personality of Godhead in such a mental state that the devotee can observe the cosmic manifestation exactly as the Supreme Personality of Godhead does. Sub such observation is not always possible, but it becomes manifest exactly like the dark planet known as Rahu, which is observed in the presence of the full moon. Purport. It has been explained in the previous verse that all desires on the mental platform become visible one after another. Sometimes, however, by the supreme will of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the whole stockpile can be visible all at one time. In Brahma Sanghita it is said, Karmani nirdhati kintu cha bhakti bhajam When a person is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, his stockpile of material desires is minimized. Indeed, the desires no longer fructify in the form of gross bodies. Instead, the stockpile of desires become visible, becomes visible on the mental platform by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this connection, the darkness occurring before the full moon, the lunar eclipse, can be explained as being another planet known as Rahu. According to Vedic astronomy, the Rahu planet, which is not visible, is accepted. Sometimes the Rahu planet is visible in the presence of full moonlight. It then appears that this Rahu planet exists somewhere near the orbit of the moon. The failure of modern moon excursionists may be due to the Rahu planet. In other words, those who are supposed to be going to the moon may actually be going to this invisible planet Rahu. Actually, they are not going to the moon, but to the planet Rahu. And after reaching this planet, they come back. Apart from this discussion, the point is that a living entity has immense and unlimited desires for material enjoyment, and he has to transmigrate from one gross body to another until these desires are exhausted. No living entity is free from the cycle of birth and death unless he takes to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, in this verse it is clearly stated, Satvaika Nishthe, that when one is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, in one stroke he is freed of past and future mental desires. Then by the grace of the Supreme Lord everything becomes simultaneously manifest within the mind. In this regard, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur cites the example of Mother Yashoda seeing the whole cosmic manifestation within the mouth of Lord Krishna. By the grace of Lord Krishna, Mother Yashoda saw all the universes and planets within the mouth of Krishna. Similarly, by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, a Krishna conscious person can see all his dormant desires at one time and finish all his future transmigrations. This facility is especially given to the devotee to make his path clear for returning home back to Godhead. Why we see things not experienced in this life is, expl is explained herein. That which we see is the future expression of a gross body or is already stocked in our mental stockpile. Because a Krishna conscious person does not have to accept a future gross body, his recorded desires are fulfilled in a dream. We therefore sometimes find things in a dream never experienced in our present life. There's so much in this verse and purport. I think we could have a year's, a year's lecture on this verse. What's this mean, Maharaj? Five classes. Five classes, all right. Well, I'll try and discuss some of these points. But actually there's, there's so much in Srila Prabhupada's purports, there's ample material for philosophers and in this section particularly for psychologists and theologists and scientists and all kinds of thinkers to be busy with for 10,000 years at least. In this verse, there's a 
transition from the previously discussed situation in the in the previous verses has been discussed the situation of the mind of a conditioned soul and now it's being described the situation of the mind of a pure devotee of Krishna what is the difference the mind is the is not that not that there's no mind that is not possible there is one so called ashram of one so called guru not just guru he became self anointed bhagwan and then died of aids this so called osho at his ashram in pune they used to have i don't know now but at the gate they used to have a sign shoes and minds to be left outside don't bring your mind in here because if anyone has any mind they can understand this is totally bogus so better don't bring your well that's not their intention their idea is that i don't know what their idea is but i can guess that their idea is that beyond the mind there is the state of osho consciousness whatever they want to call it that it's a higher level of or, or maybe there's no con- anyway it's all nonsense whatever it is but there's no question of not having a mind but what is the activity of the mind the mind in the conditioned state perceives the cosmic manifestation and the mind of a pure devotee also perceives the cosmic manifestation the mayavadis of which this osho just to give an example not that he's very significant but he's a neo mayavadi or the the ultimate result of mayavad in denying the existence of anything except brahman from satyam jagan mithya they see the cosmic manifestation as false so the ultimate result of that as shri madhvacharya predicted is that this mayavad will lead to the destruction of dharma even the worldly dharma which is not a very high platform not krishna states at the end of bhagavad gita too give that up sarva dhaman parityajya mame kam sharanam raja but still that platform is required the platform of dharma which includes many considerations including basic morality but that madhvachari predicted will be destroyed by mayavad and it, uh, dharma also means uh, consideration of religious principles consideration means one should consider what is right and what is wrong according to the edicts of shastra pravritting cha nivritting cha janana vidura suraha those who are demons they do not consider what is right and what is wrong because they d- reject shastra so mayavadis in the name of following the shastra actually rejected by rejecting its purport and then uh, ultimately one comes to the platform of this rascal i mean which uh, high sounding words and the actual activity of osho is very well known it's uh, nothing different from anything else that goes on in the material world except they're totally unabashed about it uh, sex that's the of course he would say that well you have to his i his so called philosophy is that well you do it to rise above it that's tantrism there i the, the idea that you do it and then you rise up well well i'm doing it but i'm not really doing it i'm just because i don't have any mind so the mind is not involved and i'm just doing it but i'm detached from it but that is not dharma in dharma is varnashram dharma is particularly for all these uh, 
rules and regulations and organization of varnashram dharma is meant to help one to come to the higher consciousness which begins with overcoming sexual consciousness. So in Vedic culture, sex is restricted, highly restricted. But the demons, they don't like to observe this. That is the difference between a saintly person and the demon. So how does the, what is the difference between a devotee and a non-devotee? The devotee sees the cosmic manifestation. He doesn't pretend that it doesn't exist. But he sees it as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sees it, or with the same vision as the Supreme Lord. As, whereas the non-devotee sees it as a place for his own enjoyment. Devote, Non-devotees, this is uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used the words Jagat Darshan and Golok Darshan. Jagat Darshan means to see the world with the consciousness Ishwaraham Aham Bhogi. I am the Lord of all that I survey. I am the enjoyer. Everything here is meant for my enjoyment. And a devotee sees that everything in the world is paraphernalia for serving Krishna. That is the difference. Uh, Non-devotee sees a beautiful woman and thinks, that's for my enjoyment. A devotee sees the body of a beautiful woman and or, or sees, sees that body and thinks that, well, actually this body, uh, it appears beautiful, but it's not the actual... It's a perverted reflection of the beauty of Srimati Radharani. But within that body, suffering from the misconception of being a beautiful woman is a pure spirit soul who is meant to serve Krishna. That is the vision of a devotee. So a devotee, he has this vision and in this way he observes the cosmic manifestation exactly as the Supreme Personality of Godhead does. Exactly means, yeah, he sees everything. He, as Krishna sees and explains that this uh, material world is a manifestation of Krishna's energy. It is a, uh, yeah, it's a man, it's a separated, nothing in it. It's a separated energy, but it's not, it's still Krishna's energy. It's not intrinsically separate from Krishna. This uh, achintya bheda bed, how this material world, it is separate from Krishna, but not separate from him simultaneously. By his potency, he is within the world, but not within it. Mayatatamidang sarvam jagada vyakta murti namats thani sarva bhutani nachahang teshvavastitaha. Everything that is within the world and the whole world is nothing but a manifestation of Krishna's energy. He, he's a, he fully pervades it and supports it, yet he is simultaneously aloof from it. So this achintya bheda bhed, this is right there in Bhagavad Gita. So this is how a devotee sees. Of course, there, there is a difference in how he sees the world. There, there is a slight difference. Uh, it's very major from the perspective of uh, he he sees it as the Supreme Lord sees it this is Krishna's energy Krishna sees this is my energy this is meant for Krishna's service so in that way he sees it exactly as the Supreme Lord does but the difference is that Krishna sees that this is my energy and the devotee sees this is Krishna's energy I am part of that energy I am meant for serving Krishna whereas Krishna sees everything this is meant for my service this is the psychology of a pure devotee. Now some points in here, uh, there, like I say, it, it requires a lot of discussion, more than we have time for here. The uh, psychology of a pure devotee is explained in this verse, giving an analogy. It's, it's interesting, the analogy is of the dark planet known as Rahu, one cannot see, normally Rahu cannot be seen because Rahu is described here as Tamaha, as darkness. So one cannot actually, you can't see darkness. 
it's not possible to see darkness but the dark planet Rahu can be seen when it covers the moon then it, then it becomes manifest otherwise its nature is that it's invisible so it's interesting that this analogy is given because an analogy is given why is an analogy given to make clear a, uh, a, a difficult concept by comparing it to something which is uh, well known and easily understood now in 21st century culture throughout the world the uh, understanding of Rahu covering the moon is not commonly understood Srila Prabhupada often gave analogies that when he came to the West he invented a series of analogies that would help people to understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness or he adapted traditional Vedic analogies so that Western people could understand just like the traditional analogy it's actually from the Upanishads of the soul the embodied soul being like a uh, a passenger on a chariot so Srila Prabhupada gave the example of the of the car and the driver the car is not the person it's simply a vehicle and the the driver in the car is the actual person in this analogy so to take that analogy further the the body is simply a vehicle and the soul is the uh, within the vehicle actually that example is uh, elaborately explained in the Upanishads and Lord Krishna also mentions that in Bhagavad Gita so uh, Srila Prabhupada for analogy for an analogy to be useful it has to be the uh, point of reference that that has to be instantly and easily understood if one has to explain the analogy then it's not very useful as an analogy but this is being used as an analogy it's uh, understood that by Narad Muni that Maharaj Prach Prachina Barhishat can understand this example it's been explained to him when as a child when he saw when Prachina Barhishat Maharaj saw the what we call a lunar eclipse it must have been explained to him that this is a, the dark planet Rahu which is covering the moon so it's understood by everyone in Vedic culture and it's accepted unquestioningly just like in the modern age it's unquestioningly accepted that a, uh, an eclipse is either this uh, this either the earth going between the uh, the earth's shadow falls how, how does that go which is that that's the the lunar eclipse is the earth's shadow it's said to be falling on the moon that is the modern encycl uh, explanation of an eclipse and a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the uh, orbit of the sun and the earth and blots out the vision of the sun so that's everyone accepts that I hope I got it right but uh, it's accepted as, as an axi axiomatically but in Vedic culture there's a different explanation so we can see that it was uh, the very fact that Narad Muni uses this as an analogy shows that it was fully accepted in Vedic culture and the, because he's using it as an analogy of how a pure devotee sees everything but sees everything as Krishna sees it now that may not be always obvious to everyone when one may think that a pure devotee is just like a materialist because he may talk in the same way as a materialistic person talks or acts in the same way uh, in many ways that a materialistic person acts just like uh, there was a, an editorial on a 
devotee website. I don't know if it's still up there as the editorial, as the main editorial, but it was uh, poking fun at sannyasis for having laptop computers and iPods and things like that. So to a materialistic person, it might appear that if a sannyasi has these things, well, he's just a materialist, because that's the kind of thing that materialistic people like. Uh, but it's hoped that the sannyasis of ISKCON who are using these things do so in the same spirit that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarsar Thakur and our own Srila Prabhupada also used the latest technology available to the, them at the time unabashedly because they saw everything in this world as paraphernalia for serving Krishna. And they didn't think that now I need a, a laptop computer for my sense gratification, but they thought that if we have to use this for our service to Krishna. So to a materialistic person, it might appear that if uh, two sannyasis are talking about the latest computer and which is the best one to get, they might think, well, they're just, just another materialist. They're interested in computers like everyone else. But then you have to see what they're using it for. So this consciousness, uh, yeah, the, the principle of yukta vairagya, the uh, the neophyte or, or improper understanding of vairagya or renunciation is that one should give up everything. But that supposed renunciation is rejected, it's renounced by Rupa Goswami Prabhupada as falgu vairagya or meaningless vairagya because one who fails to see the relationship of everything within this world with Hari, Hari Sambandha Vastuni. He thinks that, well, everything should be given up. We, we, the, we're not part of this world. Uh, we should be spiritual, and spiritual means giving everything up. But this vairagya, which is desired by the mumukshu, those who are desirous of liberation from this world, that vairagya is called falgu, or very light or meaningless or useless because for a start we can't give anything up if you want to give everything up well you have to give up your body too you have to give up breathing don't, don't use the air you're going to I'm giving up everything and going to the forest I, but in the forest you also you're also breathing so stop breathing if you really want to give up everything that's also material the air is also material so the, what is to be given up is the perverted sense of ownership that I have anything to... We don't have anything to give up anyway because nothing belongs to us. And the idea that I can give something up is only the flip side of the misconception that everything here in this world is for me to enjoy. But it's, not, it's, uh, it's uh, another expression of the idea that everything is here in this world is for me to enjoy, but I can't enjoy it. I'm not enjoying it. Um, so let me give it all up and I'll be happier in that way it's another attempt to enjoy self-enjoyment denying this that everything is meant for the service of Krishna but a, a devotee sees everything in the world is meant for serving Krishna and therefore a devotee can, can and should use all the best things of the world for serving Krishna if we can serve Krishna better by uh, flying from one place to another for preaching then why should we go by uh, rickshaw or walking of course rickshaw distance and flight distance is, uh, uh, take a look. yeah anyway why 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 uh, why in the name of why accept uh, difficulty for the body if that difficulty impedes our service to Krishna. That means we, we haven't actually understood the principle of spiritual life. So it may appear that a pure devotee is just another materialist. But then, uh, when his activities are seen in relationship to Krishna, that, that may become manifest at, at some point. He's a, a pure devotee doesn't make a show of being a great devotee but he, we, we find that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself and the Acharyas after him they were reserved in the matter of showing their Krishna consciousness they, they didn't show it off 
in public or trying to make a show of being very advanced. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he met Ramananda Rai for the first time on the banks of the Godavari, then naturally both of them uh, were extremely ecstatic and that became manifest in the persons by, by crying and shivering and all the symptoms of pure devotional service. But then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu noted that some materialistic brahmanas were accompanying Ramananda Rai and they were shocked. They couldn't work out what was going on. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he uh, deliberately restrained himself from exhibiting those symptoms. And we find also that Srila Prabhupada, uh, he didn't uh, make a show of being a pure devotee or go around trying to convince everyone he's a pure devotee, but he simply got on with the business of serving Krishna, which is actually what pure devotees do. Uh, but sometimes his uh, pure devotion to Krishna would become manifest, even without Srila Prabhupada's desire. Sometimes in a very uh, striking manner, Srila Prabhupada would go into trance, or his voice would falter and he would cry, or sometimes, for those who had the, the vision to see it, he just his, his uh, constantly talking of Krishna, his anger in becoming, his becoming angry at persons who blasphemed Krishna, these are all symptoms of pure devotional service. So as long as... Uh, he might have been discussing sometimes with his secretaries about where shall we go, shall we go here or shall we go there or, and what's convenient and this and that and it might seem that he was talking in the manner of a tourist like in the same way that tourists might talk but then uh, we have to see his, his activities, what was he doing he wasn't going here and there for sightseeing but he was going here and there for Delivering wherever he went, he delivered the people of the world. So, pure devotional service. This is the the natural propensity of every living being. The that becomes covered, that becomes eclipsed by mundane consciousness. As I said, there's so much to be discussed in this purport. The whole uh, Srila Prabhupada, his uh, unabashed presentation of they didn't go to the moon, which was considered absurd, it seemed, to those who didn't have full faith in Srila Prabhupada. It might have seen, seemed absurd. There was there was, it must have been 1968, there's one conversation with Srila Prabhupada, which is in the conversations book, and there's uh, one reporter, I believe it's in San Francisco, asking Srila Prabhupada that, about the upcoming moonshot, the men are going to go on the moon, and Prabhupada said, no, they're not. And the reporter said, well, they are. Everyone knows it's, it's upcoming, the, the, they're going to go to the moon. Prabhupada said, no, they're not, they can't go. And the reporter said, well, what happens if they do go? Won't that, be, uh, won't that affect the faith of your disciples? And Prabhupada said, no, they won't go, so it won't affect, they, they, they can't go. So it's not, there's no question of them going, so, but what if they do go, actually do, you know, they're all prepared for going, and what if they actually go? And Prabhupada just stuck to his point, they're not going to go, because they can't go. And the reporter couldn't get it. And I suppose when the reporter was watching that one small step for man and a great step, one great step for mankind, he was thinking that Swami was, you know, a nice old man, but, you know, just, he got it wrong on this one. And some of Prabhupada's disciples thought like that, not so many at the time, more nowadays, because they don't have Prabhupada personally there to, to, uh, yell at them <laughs> or whatever of course we can't predict how Srila Prabhupada would deal with this uh, s somewhat widespread lack of faith in him within his movement on many issues 
uh, yeah, but the, the, he always made this point. He was completely unabashed that in, in, the, in the scripture, in the Shastra, it states that the moon is further away in the sun. Never it must be, because the Shastra is coming from Krishna. And the scientists, they have one opinion today and another tomorrow, and so what do we care for them? Anyway, I don't have time to get into that. It's a big subject, very big subject. The one subject is the uh, the moon further away than the sun. That's one big subject. Another one is the lack of faith in Srila Prabhupada. That's a very big subject. It's very dangerous for our whole movement. But anyway, I'll leave you hanging in the air. Uh, like Trishanku and uh, finish the class there and if there are any questions I can take one or two yes we have a photo finish there but I don't have a camera so I saw Archit Prabhu first so I, I think that's not coming through. I'll just repeat it for the benefit of those who are watching via their computer. Those materialistic people, is it, are watching through their computer? Is it materialistic to watch this through a computer? Should they throw away their computer? You mentioned this business of the uh, moon and how the reporter surmised, the mayor surmised, that the moon shape painted from his followers if he actually did that. So uh, this was actually brought to Prabhupada while he was still here. So I was following the same Prabhupada. You know, his wife accepted everything, and Prabhupada said, even if they did, what did they accomplish? They brought back some rocks. That's another point, yeah. They brought back some rocks, and it looked just like rocks in Arizona. So, <laughs> what did they actually Rocks do? in Arizona. Hmm, I wonder where they came from. Actually, uh, the devotees always gave the example of Arizona, but it appears that the actual moonshot landed in Nevada because that's where the uh, secret base is that no one can go into. Yes, please. Another question about the moon. Interestingly, uh, as you all probably know, there is nowadays widespread doubt among the American public that they actually went to the moon. And widespread doubt that anything the politicians say is true because it's come to light that many of the things they say are not true. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not an, uh, an astronomer and I don't know the answer to this and it's just put it on the list of 20 trillion and one of the things that need researching because if we are to establish Vedic knowledge in the world there's a lot of work to do in research in many fields in, in, in actually in every field of, of knowledge but I can suggest that something which is invisible to the eye from this planet uh, might be visible if they had gone there it might be visible if they'd actually landed there you get my point in other words uh, yeah when you when you when you get right there you can see it but at, at the uh, from here it's uh, if it's all black that means it's 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 not absorbing the light of the sun and like the moon does to reflect the uh, the moon is visible actually Srila Prabhupada gave two explanations of why the moon is visible one is that it has its own light and another that it reflects the sunlight which is the modern scientific explanation also so something which is black doesn't reflect anything that's why people who go out for early morning runs, they uh, running for exercise, 
they uh, on on their they either wear bright clothing or they put some something reflective on their uh, clothing so that motorists are going by can see it. That's why in a in a hot climate the it's good to wear white or bright colored clothing because that uh, that reflects the light. But if you wear black clothing, it absorbs it, the heat of the sun. So we find in hot countries people wear bright clothes and that may be one reason for that. It's just good for reflecting the sunlight. I, I'm postulating that, that's all. I'm giving a, a possible explanation. I'm not a scientist of any sort. So, I, But I can simply suggest that there, there, there should be some explanation. That's all. When Rahu goes in front of it, when, when, when uh, supposedly, well, we understand from the Bible that the moon is invisible, right? No, no, not the moon is not invisible. Rahu, Rahu is invisible. Yeah, yeah. The astronaut, whoever, is uh, the one that becomes visible. Is that what you're All right. Well, Brigopati Prabhu is volunteering to answer this. Save me. That that's not really the point that Naikama proposed. But he's talking he's about talking about sensual about sensual perception. Well, yeah, yeah. Take it from that perspective that you're allowed to you know you're maybe the inhabitants of Rahu let their let people come there if there are inhabitants. I don't know, and I don't know if anyone knows. But uh, like I say, there. Many, many things to be researched. And uh, many, many points to be researched. Even in this verse, Sadvaika, what is it? I can't see it. I, I, Sadvaika Nishta. The Prabhupada translates this Sattva Eka Nishta as being in Krishna consciousness. It doesn't directly state that at all, but that can be understood from the statement. Here in the fourth canto of Lord Shiva, that Sattvang Vishuddham Vasudeva Shabditam, that to be in pure Sattva means to be in Krishna consciousness. So someone might criticize that, well, it's just Prabhupada's. He's just, it doesn't say in Krishna consciousness, it says Sattvaika Nishtha. But that's, uh, that is extrapolated from the Sattva, Sattvaika Nishtha means in Krishna consciousness and that, that can be understood from other statements in the Bhagavatam. So like that. Yeah. Please pass over the, the mic for a comment. That's true, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Amiya Vilas Swami Maharaj will make what we can have as the last comment. Unless it's a question. What is the real form of research? Well, those, those. Huh? Hmm? Huh? Sorry. The, uh, what the 
real term of research I, I don't understand the question it needs to be researched yeah research means you don't know and you try to find out the means by which you can know yeah that's the answer that's the answer research means that th that method by which things which are not known uh, become known well uh, often he says that there's no need to research because everything's in Shastra we can simply accept that Krishna is supreme but uh, on that platform there's no need to research to to find out what is the fact but how it's a fact that we made to establish that for those who don't have that faith and to understand it better that may require researching and Srila Prabhupada wanted for instance the uh, BI Bhaktivedanta Institute to undertake uh, philosophical research and scientific research to demonstrate these points in one conversation he said that one of the duties when he was talking about Varnashram he said one of the duties of Brahmanas is research so he didn't reject research per se but the uh, attitude of researchers that we can only find out everything by research that is mental speculation what should I proper differentiated in one letter between mental speculation in which one, which one thinks that one has to find out the truth by one's own method and philosophical speculation in which uh, one accepts the truth of Shastra but applies one's intelligence to try to understand how it is true and there's another point here from Shvavash Prabhu he's got his hand very strongly up there <laughs> I just thought I'd throw in a comment on this issue because uh, there was a lecture of Prabhupada that said that uh, Darwin has actually killed the soul in society. So basically what that means is that everyone's on the body of the life and they can't think any further than this. So when you talk about these kind of issues, uh, he, you know, he has killed eternality. Uh, he's killed the idea of uh, a, a soul or even for that matter God. And everything is simply on the, on the body of the platform. They can't think any higher than that. So matter means everything to them. So on these issues that we're discussing, it, it appears as higher than matter. Uh, it, 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 these issues take uh, you know higher intelligence. If you're going to discuss about the moon, yeah, 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 the moon yeah. Is, is, is a, you know it's a heavenly planet. It has nothing to do with this. You know, well, it does, but it's higher than this particular. It's planet. it's more subtle energy. It's uh, yes. it's not formed of earth, water, fire and air it would seem it was, it's an ethereal planet and then we're talking about the moon god who's a, who's a demigod who's, yeah. whose powers are uh, way surpassing any human understanding yeah. and you know, speak of Rahu who was actually you know, he was also a demon but at the same time he was a very uh, you know, powerful mystical demon so it appears to me that uh, because of the Darwinism theory it's very difficult to even conceptualize yeah, these things, yeah. Because yeah. He's killed the soul. Yeah. And he's made everyone think that you're just going to body, you do whatever you like, and this is your last life, and you came from a monkey. You didn't come from anything, you know, like God. So, uh, you know, th this is one thing I think is very important you made that, yeah, that's why the yeah, used to be there, because uh, they need to kick on the space, as Prabhupada said himself, uh, kick, kick on the face of Darwinism because he has killed the soul. And, and it's important for us to uh, speak about these matters, although they're inconceivable to most of us. Yeah. And, uh, that's natural. That's yeah, I, I can't explain to to any scientist or how the moon is further away than the sun. But I accept that because Prabhupada said it and Shastra said it. But I understand also that uh, why obviously Prabhupada wanted these matters researched so they could be presented for the elucidation of those uh, scientists who are sincere enough to accept it and to kick on the face of those who don't and oh one more point oh lots of points well I leave it up to you Shravash Prabhu you can cut out whenever you like it's up to
Well, I don't know if my lifetime's that long. But. Yes, I want to start a Shastric Research Institute. That is my plan. Please give your blessings. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's these uh, pras these three prasthanas. They are uh, for those who accept the Vedic culture, for the, those who accept the Vedas as authoritative. For those who don't, we have to adopt some other means of convincing them, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did with the Buddhists, as Prabhupada did with everyone in the Western world who didn't accept the Shastra. He preached Krishna consciousness and presented the same philosophy but in giving examples and in terms that they could accept so this uh, and even for even if we accept these uh, three prasthans much of that knowledge is is uh, lost nowadays so or even within that just like even within that arena there's also just just like we find that uh, certain followers of or of Madhvacharya are very aggressive against our sampradaya and say you're not part of you're not part of uh, our sampradaya that has to be established there are the uh, so-called Babaji's of Radha, Kund and Navadvip who say we don't have a proper s s sampradaya or parampara so these issues also have to be taken up there's a lot of work to do it's alright for us to say we, bel we accept Krishna in Bhagavad Gita but preaching means that understanding that not everyone will accept that and bringing them to the, to the point convincing them by their intelligence that that is true as Krishna did with Arjuna He's, Arjuna had various doubts and Krishna satisfied him with his intelligence by giving intelligent replies Krishna could have just told Arjuna look I'm God just do what I say but he didn't do that. Arjuna would have been ready to accept, but Krishna didn't do that. He convinced him philosophically. And Srila Prabhupada also took the time and trouble to convince people philosophically. Yeah, they uh, they established that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. So one thing uh, on in on various points in Shastra, especially Jiva Goswami established shastrically. But then uh, that's uh, how many of us know all those arguments. So one thing to do would be to research Jiva Goswami. But then the the, the nature of Maya is that she offers unlimited. Uh, permutations and combinations of atheistic arguments which have to be dealt with in context if we if someone comes up and says that well actually life comes from matter and you and you and we say well Jiva Goswami says this uh, what do they care what Jiva Goswami they, they don't we have to present it in uh, in the accepted according to the accepted paradigms of uh, the paradigms they accept and then take it from there All right, Hare Krishna. Oh. Shri